Ho, ho, ho! Merry Christmas to all of you, wherever you may be stuck owing to COVID restrictions. And to liberate my mind, if not my body, I'm using a Macedonian wine. Macedonian wines are among the best in the world. And no, I'm not a shill. I'm not receiving a commission for saying this. And it's not advertising. It's simply a fact. So here we are. Let's pour a glass to this oncoming year. It cannot be worse than the previous two. Today, I'm going to attack men. It's not the first time I'm doing this. I'm an equal opportunity abuser. I have several videos attacking the current modern misconduct of men because men are misbehaving big time. Not that women are not, but men, in a way, have started it 5,000 years ago. So today I'm going to focus on men and what men do to women. I refer you to a series of videos I've made previously about contemporary sexuality, about uh, the way modern women comport themselves, make choices and decisions, their psychological background and social, socio-psychological background, and so on and so forth. It would be a good introduction to this video. This whole thing, this whole kind of cycle of videos is part and parcel of my new syllabus of youth sexuality, a syllabus that I'm preparing, that I'm writing as we speak, uh, for CIAPS, the Center for International and Advanced Professional Studies, the outreach program of the CIAS Consortium of Universities. Youth sexuality is going to be taught in CIAPS starting in October, and I'm submitting the final draft of the syllabus for the fifth time, um, actually on the 27th. So this is the final video uh, in the cycle, and I hope this way I'm going to wrap up the topic and revert to my old abode, narcissism, psychopathy, borderline, and other wonderful manifestations of the human spirit. Okay, Shoshanim, let's start with facts. In aggregate, women are now earning more than men. Yes, it's a fact. Women make more money than men. Actually, about two in every five providers are now men. Primary breadwinners are now women. So 40% of primary breadwinners are now women. Their men stay at home. They are house husbands <laughs> or housemen. They take care of the kids. They clean the house. They throw the garbage. There's been a reversal in this sense, and it's ongoing. Women now are earning more than men because they are way more educated. Anywhere, anywhere between 60 and 70% of college graduates are actually women. And the best predictor of lifelong income is education. The higher your education, the more money you make throughout your professional life. Women had monopolized certain critical professions, anything from the judiciary to medicine, teaching, of course. And women today prefer their careers to any men for much longer than before. Women marry much, much later, 32 years of age in the United Kingdom, 28 years of age in the United States. That's something like 10 years, about 10 years later than just 20 years ago. So women are postponing marriage and postponing committed relationships. Actually, uh, marriage is in the minority nowadays. Most women cohabit. If they do engage in a committed relationship, they cohabit in order to maintain the flexibility to exit their relationship and pursue their career. For example, if they have to relocate. About two-fifths of women, two-fifths of women, around 45%, across the lifespan, remain single for life. They go celibate or they do casual sex. That's according to Pew Center studies between 2019 and 2021. Women are catching up with men in a variety of other unsavory ways. I'm sorry to say that women are beginning to be equal to men when it comes to infidelity. 
the rate of adultery, extramarital affairs, and cheating generally, betrayal, are now almost equal um, between men and women. Narcissism is on the rise among women, and today there's an equal number of people diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder among women as among men, 50-50. Psychopathy is on the rise among women, and if we consider borderline personality disorder to be a form of secondary psychopathy, as is the current cutting-edge thinking, then perhaps there are more psychopathic women than men. Promiscuity, of course, is, is equal among men and women, which is a shocking development, absolutely shocking development, because promiscuous sexual behavior had gone up 30-fold within 40 years among women. And finally, antisocial behavior, behaviors among women are becoming more and more common, and that includes violent crime. So, women are becoming more and more like men. Lisa Wade and others point to huge studies, enormous studies, over 40 years, of 30 to 40,000 people, which demonstrate conclusively that women describe themselves more and more in masculine terms, as men also use the same terms to describe themselves. So women are become, becoming more and more manly. They close the gap with men in terms of self-image, self-description, and self-perception. And we end up with unigender, a single gender, a masculine gender, in a hyper-masculinized world. Women are empowered in all fields of life. But there's one exception, sex and interpersonal relationships. Women are empowered in their careers. Women are empowered in their relationships with colleagues, with the, with the institutions, with the authorities, you name it. But when it comes to sex and interpersonal relationships, women are less empowered than ever. How come? Why this discrepancy? It's because of men. To attract men and to keep men, women still self-objectify. Actually, they self-objectify much more than their great-grandmothers. Self-objectification started more or less in the 1920s when makeup became very common. Yes, there was no makeup before 1920, believe it or not. Makeup is a modern, a new invention. So women started to self-objectify, to doll up, to become objects of sexual desire, to transition from being sexual to being sexy, to use Paris Hilton's famous adage. So women became sexy rather than sexual. This, this started in the 1920s, but it had reached a crescendo recently. Women self-objectify like never before. They groom, they titivate themselves, they wear skimpy clothing, they go under the knife. Plastic and cosmetic, cosmetic surgery had absolutely supernova <laughs> And women succumb to the most degrading sexual demands of men, even total strangers in hookups or in group sex. And group sex, like threesomes, is becoming more and more common, as do open relationships, a license to cheat. Sex and intimacy are men's alamo. Remember the alamo. Sex and intimacy are the last stand of men in an ever-shrinking enclave of virility and erstwhile dominance. It's a vengeful throwback. Men regard sex and intimate relationships as the last place on earth where they could still be men, masculine, dominant, in control, and dictate. Now, some may say this is toxic masculinity, but it is traditional masculinity in, in large measure. It's become toxic because of the siege mentality of men. Men now exaggerate and caricature waning chauvinistic machoism as a way to punish uppity women for their inexorable ascendance. They want to put women in their place, reduce women to size. And how can men do that? How can, how can you contain a woman? She makes more money than you. She's more educated than you. She's more skilled than you. 
she goes further in life than you. She's more powerful than you. There's only one way. Humiliate and degrade her sexually. Prostitute her if you can. Abuse her in a relationship verbally, psychologically, financially, and otherwise. Trample on her whenever she tries to get close. Convert intimacy into a form of nightmare. Render the whole thing surrealistic. And that's precisely what men do on a massive scale. Consequently, we have a subculture of refugees from abusive relationships. We have tens of millions of women who had graduated from the school of masculine abuse. And they, are, they act exactly as refugees do. They have all the dynamics of refugees, including complex trauma, CPTSD. These women are wary of men. They suspect men, they mistrust men, and many of them hate men actively. Being sexually and emotionally abused to women, abusive to women is men's way of restoring their challenged grandiose superiority. Now, most of this superiority had been merely imagined. A lot of this so-called superiority had been enforced by muscle power. Men acted as bullies. They tortured women, domestic violence and abuse. They hospitalized a woman who would talk back and argue and challenge. So men used muscle power, raw muscle power, to subjugate women. Now, that's not working anymore because A, it's illegal. Two, it's not self-efficacious in a modern technology-empowered world. So men had lost their only advantage they ever had, their muscle power. And so now they feel bereft. They feel the underdog. They feel discriminated against. They regard the whole power structure as a leverage of women against them. They say that women use the legal system, for example, to emasculate them and to steal their money, their hard-earned money. And so there's a war, a nascent war between men and women in divorce courts, in hookups, in dating, so-called dating, dating had become a glorified term for hookups, in bars and pubs and nightclubs across the world, men are fighting women and women are defending themselves to a large extent unsuccessfully. Men are wielding the good old reliable double standard, slut shaming, pathologizing, pathologizing women who are sexually active women who love sex and men, women who pursue sex, you know, in a liberated, emancipated way, without shame. Men pathologize these women. They say that they are not relationship material and they slut shame them. Um, the same behavior is judged differently depending on who perpetrates it. A man is judged differently to a woman and men will never give up on the double standard. It's the last remaining weapon. It's a weapon of last resort. They're never going to give up on it. <laughs> on the very contrary, they're going to enhance the perniciousness and they're going to enhance the all pervasiveness of the double standard. They're going to render it structural. They're, make it, they're going to make it a part of the so sexual script of the future, a part of the gender role of the future. Men are on the retreat. They have a siege mentality, as I, as I said, and they're fighting back. They're fighting back and it's red in tooth and claw. The battle is joined and it is bloody and it is um, gloomy and it is ominous. And so each of the parties, men and women, are using all the tools at their disposal to eviscerate, emasculate, um, the other side. It's a battlefield out there. Love is a battlefield. She was right. And women are reacting, of course, to men's abuse. Women increasingly are going their own way. Um, the same, there's, there's a minority of men who are doing the same. MGTOW, men going their own way. There's a, an even smaller minority of men who are very violent and aggressive about it, incels. And so there's a, a comparable movement of women, women. It's not a structured movement. It's not an organized movement. You won't find much of it online. 
but you could easily call it women going the wrong way. Every year since 2016, a majority of women in the United States had avoided men altogether, not a single encounter. Lesbianism had tripled in the past 20 years. Right now, one of every six women is a, an avowed and proclaimed lesbian. Other parts of the world are following suit with alacrity. One of the weapons that women have is infidelity. Cheating had absolutely exploded among women, and women justify cheating. They say their needs are not being met. They say they are being abused. They blame men for their uh, decision-making. They blame men for their utterly non-normative and immoral behavior, because cheating is immoral. Now, men have been doing the same for centuries. Men had been cheating on women and betraying them for centuries. Here, the double standard is at play again. A cheating woman is one thing, a cheating man is another. Boys be boys. Women are supposed to be saintly and virginal. They're not supposed to cheat. But men had become, women had become more and more masculine. So now they cheat. And toxic masculinity is now the norm against, uh, among women, as well as among men. I would say that both women and men are now displaying toxic masculinity, coupled with unrestricted sociosexuality. Uh, we see an explosion of dark triad personalities. Allow me to explain what I just said. Toxic masculinity is a set of behaviors um, which reinforce each other and reject gender differences and accommodation of the needs of the opposite gender. But toxic masculinity now characterizes both men and women in a unigender world. Toxic masculinity goes hand in hand in some cases, in many cases actually, with something which we call unrestricted social sexuality. Now, unrestricted social, social sexuality is not a sexual orientation, as many of you had written to me. It is not. Um, it is a fancy name a fancy term for promiscuity, simply. So, unrestricted sexuality, the tendency to have sex in non-committed relationships and often casually, casual sex, coupled with toxic masculinity, go hand in hand with dark triad personalities. In other words, with narcissism, psychopathy, and Machiavellianism. This is the combination from hell. It's a triple whammy. Surprisingly, though, this unsavory mix, toxic masculinity, promiscuity, dark triad personality, this unsavory mix does not always automatically translate into infidelity. If the intimate partner is boundaried and committed to the relationship, the risk of infidelity is no higher than average. So why is infidelity exploding? Because people are not committed in their relationships. And why are people not committed in their relationships? Because, one, they don't want to commit or to invest. Men get sex, no strings attached sex, so why would they commit or invest? You know, you got the milk, why buy the cow? So men have an inbuilt incentive. The incentive structure of current sexual scripts and mores is such that men don't want to commit or to invest because they're getting everything they want, sex, no strings attached, free of cost, anywhere, online or offline. Women, on the other hand, do not want to commit because they are um, invested in their cherished careers. And then later on, they lack the skills to maintain intimacy and to have meaningful sex with men. And they are also exposed to men's abusive ways as a way to restore the sense of masculinity and virility. So put all of this together, commitment to career, abuse in relationships, and lack of ability or lack of knowledge or lack of skills on how to have meaningful emotional sex and how to maintain intimacy, and it renders women equally non-committal. So men don't want to commit, women don't want to commit, there's no commitment in relationships. 
The lack of commitment in intimate relationships nowadays is considered the main reason for infidelity. And it is the first time in human history where men actually are more committed than women. Men, for the first time, starting in 2019, men are the ones who want deep, romantic, intimate, long-term relationships. And they want these relationships more than women do. Women are the ones who are rejecting men, not the other way around. The first time in human history, both genders are equally invested, women a little more than men, in not having committed relationships. And this, of course, gives rise to infidelity. Additionally, if sex is meaningless, if sex is emotionless, then sex doesn't matter. It's like, you know, having dinner with someone. So because sex doesn't matter, because of this permissive attitude to sex, cheating is perceived, is perceived infidelity is perceived as nothing special, nothing meaningful. And so why make a, why make a fuss about it? Why, why make a big deal about it? It happens, you know, I was drunk, this, that. And so I, I cheated on you, but it's, it's just an incident. Don't take it so badly, you know? So uh, infidelity is more and more accepted socially and more and more accepted individually within relationships. Plus, between you and me, infidelity is great because it allows the partners to not invest in the relationship, to not commit in the relationship, and to blame the other. I am not committed to the relationship, I'm not investing in a relationship, and I'm being abusive to you because you had cheated on me. Cheating is a great way to legitimize abuse within relationships. Both parties engage rampantly, celebrate this newfound um, excuses and freedom to abuse each other. The problem is that few people bearing this psychological profile um, are boundaried. And even fewer people with this psychological profile are able to commit within relationships. They have what we call insecure attachment styles. So when we have someone with toxic masculinity, which today characterizes men and women, and someone with uh, someone who engages in substance abuse, and someone who is social, sexually permissive or unrestricted, in other words, promiscuous, and finally, someone who is a bit psychopathic, a bit narcissistic, a bit Machiavellian, when we have this time bomb put together, it bodes ill for the capacity to have long-term relationships or for their longevity once they are embarked upon. And so now these things are so, these parameters, these dimensions, these traits or characteristics are so widespread that we could easily say that the majority of population, one way or another, has some of them. And a, a sizable minority has, have all of them. So these kind of people, they tend to bail out they tend to cheat with the first sign of serious difficulties in the relationship. And accustomed to meaningless and unemotional sex, these people hold a more permissive and dismissive view of extramarital casual sexual encounters. They dismiss them. Consequently, the phenomenon of serial cheating is substantially on the rise. People don't cheat once anymore. They make it a life habit. I can't emphasize enough how important it is to get fully informed regarding the relationship and sexual histories of a potential intimate partner. Whenever you come across someone and you consider the possibility of having a relationship with them, ask, ask and ask again. Yes, interrogate them. Interrogate them about their relationship and sexual history. Why? Because past misbehavior is an infallible predictor of future misbehavior, period. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. It's nonsense. That's precisely why in psychology, we study people's past. The only way to get to know people is to get really, really acquainted to the minutest details with their past, or you would be in for some very nasty surprises. So this is where we stand 
women are on the ascendance, men are reacting by abusing them and degrading them sexually, the incidence of infidelity is increasing, as does the incidence of uh, celibacy. People are opting out by changing sexual orientation. Women are becoming, more and more women are becoming lesbian. I think same sex among men is also increasing, although more stealthily, it's less reported, owing to stigma and so on. And there is a veritable supernova, not of empathy, <laughs> not a super empath or supernova empath, not this nonsense, but there is a veritable supernova in a variety of antisocial, narcissistic, psychopathic um, behaviors, in toxic masculinity, in promiscuity, unrestricted social sexuality, and in uh, dark triad and dark tetrad personalities. This is the perfect storm. Men have had been abusing women for millennia and killing women for millennia. Men had also been protecting women for millennia and facilitating women's survival for millennia. Women, on the other hand, are taking matters into their own hands now, as, as they should, and so they should. Women are becoming independent, autonomous, self-efficacious, and agentic. Good for them. But in this process, women had adopted male role models. Wrong male role models. Bullies, narcissists, and psychopaths. Everyone is becoming more narcissistic and more psychopathic. We are living in a society where men and women are becoming indistinguishable except through their genitalia. And this is extremely bad news for the human species.